Imagine being the CEO of the biggest wrestling promotion on the planet. Imagine being the guy who makes all the creative decisions. Imagine being the guy who signs everybody's paycheck at the end of the week. Imagine being in charge of what probably is the most talented roster that this company has ever seen. Imagine putting your son-in-law in charge of what is the A brand in WWE, NXT. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. If you don't know it, you're just being an, an ignorant fuck. You're fooling yourself. Imagine your son-in-law in charge of the A brand in WWE. The A brand in NXT that has four of the most talented men right now in the entire company. Not only the company, but probably the entire world of professional wrestling. Aleister Black, Johnny Gargano, who has delivered nothing but five-star matches all over the fucking NXT universe. Johnny Takeover is what they call him. Tommaso Ciampa and the story that is Tommaso Ciampa being out for nine months, coming back bigger and better than ever, and having the biggest run of his life, becoming the best heel in the entire wrestling world. And then Ricochet, a guy who mesmerizes and just amazes everybody with his feats of athleticism. Imagine these guys at your disposal. It's exciting to think about. Imagine fantasy booking these guys on Monday Night Raw or SmackDown Live. The matches that we can come up with are unbelievable. Unbelievable. It would make anybody get excited. But the excitement with anybody that hits the main roster quickly fades away. Imagine wanting these guys on the main roster and making their debut in front of a live audience. It's exciting on a Monday night. But imagine that live audience is sitting in the Cajun Dome in Lafayette, Louisiana. I don't know who made this decision on this night to debut all four of these men, but I swear to God, man, I hope that this man has nightmares upon nightmares upon nightmares tonight and has months and months and months of sleepless nights. Seriously. This, this decision tonight to debut them in front of this crowd may have been the dumbest thing I've seen in many, many, many years with the WWE. Absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. I honestly became depressed watching this show. And this show featured four of the best talents in this company who obviously were the best things on this show in front of the one of the most depressing crowds I have ever seen for a live wrestling crowd. Miserable. Absolutely fucking miserable. Like, I don't understand the, the mentality and the logic behind this move. It, it, was, it was as if they, they wanted to give you a Raw after Mania after Elimination Chamber. This audience didn't even know these four men were debuting tonight. I got an alert on my phone that Ricochet, Aleister Black, and DIY were backstage at Monday Night Raw two hours before Monday Night Raw went on the air. How is that? How is that creativity and logic? How? How is that handling Monday Night Raw in its best interests. That is the dumbest thing I ever fucking seen. Two hours in front of a crowd who didn't even pop for Sasha Banks and Bayley while they celebrated winning the Monday Night Raw SmackDown Live Women's Tag Team Championships. People. I love NXT just as much as everybody else watching me. But I gotta honestly tell you, that tonight's show 
even with my boys on the show, was absolutely fucking miserable. And I don't want to hear people praising this show. I don't want to hear people coming into my comment section telling me that I'm negative. You got to look at the bigger picture here. You have to look at the bigger picture here. Why was a decision like this made on this night? There is only one night, maybe two nights, out of the year in which a Hail Mary pass like this show would work. That's the Raw after Mania or the Raw after SummerSlam. Those are the only two nights in which a show like we've seen tonight would actually work. And I don't understand Lafayette, Louisiana. NXT debuts in Lafayette, Louisiana. You could not wait till you got to a bigger city. Do you know how it pained me to watch Aleister Black's entrance get zero reaction? Do you know how much it pained me to see Ricochet do his his handspring into the flip and land on his feet in the middle of the ring to no reaction? They tried to book a Raw after Mania after the Elimination Chamber. New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago. Those are the cities you need to start debuting these guys in. It should be mandatory that every pay-per-view that you have, the Monday Night Raw that follows that pay-per-view, needs to be in a big city. Needs to be in a big city. I don't know why they left Texas to go to fucking Louisiana. Couldn't have the show in San Antonio or Austin. Dallas. There is much bigger problems in the WWE. We all know that. We know what they are. We definitely know what they are. Most of them have to do with the old man that's booking this show. There is much bigger issues at hand here. Bringing up NXT talent is not going to save Monday Night Raw. There's a timing thing that needs to be in in place. You, You can't debut these guys on the main roster in some random fucking city. There's a time and a place for everything. You have to look at the bigger picture here. This was a band-aid on a wound that won't stop bleeding. What did this do for the grand picture that is WrestleMania? What? There's 49 days till WrestleMania. You just wasted seven days of the build for WrestleMania on this show. Unless Johnny Gargano, Champa, Ricochet, and Aleister Black are going to be on WrestleMania, what was the fucking point of this show? There was no point to this show. There was absolutely no point to this show. None of these guys, I swear to God, I, I don't want to, I hope that's not the case. I don't see any of these guys, maybe Aleister Black, I don't see any of these guys being a mainstay on the main roster. What was the point of this? To showcase NXT? To showcase NXT in Lafayette, Louisiana. And then people want to say, I'm negative. And people want to say that I'm too critical, or I overanalyze things, or... I'm just salty, or I'm just angry. I'm an angry New Yorker. None of this made sense. How is this a good business move? Now when I have to watch all four of these men debut on the main roster, the only thing I'm going to think about is when they really debuted in front of Lafayette, Louisiana. If I had a switch, if I had a switch to gas this crowd... I would have hit it 10 times over. And I would have laughed as the, as the green mist just floated about in the fucking Cajun Dome. I would have loved to guess this fucking crowd. Miserable. I wanted to fucking slip my wrist watching this show. 
Ricochet, Alistair Black, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa debut, and it means absolutely nothing to anybody. It'll mean something to all the other fucking idiots in the community who want to spread positivity. Oh, why don't you just accept it and, and move on? Your four favorites debuted on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, but what was the fucking meaning behind it? What was the point of it? There is no point. You know, I don't want to mention some certain agenda that's going on in the wrestling world nowadays, but, you know, WWE is really trying to give you something different. Listen, I appreciate that. I appreciate the effort. But, you know, there's a right place and a right time to do everything. Tonight wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right time. AEW has everybody fucking just going crazy. You can't tell me that WWE is not worried. Of all the days you want to bring up these guys, this was a good effort in just wanting to debut something fresh and new and exciting, new matchups, new faces. But... Like I mentioned before, man, there's a, there's, a, there's a place and a time for everything. This is not going to work on a random Monday after a fucking B-level pay-per-view. It's not going to work. WrestleMania, again, 49 days away with WrestleMania. What did this do for WrestleMania? Now you have minus one week in the build towards WrestleMania. Nothing was built towards WrestleMania. Nothing was built towards Fastlane on this show. We're three weeks away from Fastlane. You know, Justin Labar said it best on, on Twitter. In a market like Lafayette, Louisiana, that needs to be heavily promoted with big names, WWE chose this city on this night to debut four of the biggest fucking guys in the company with no advertisement whatsoever, two hours via a fucking notification on your mobile device, two hours before they went live at 8 o'clock. If that doesn't show you exactly what the fucking problem is with this company, I don't know what will. That shows you that the show wasn't even written. Or it might have been written, but nowhere near completion for 8 o'clock. This, this just looked and smelled and felt like a fucking Hail Mary pass in the fourth corner with absolutely no time remaining on the clock. And what did it do? Incomplete pass. You tried and you fucking failed. Now go hit the showers and come back again next season. Open your eyes, people. Open your fucking eyes. Dominic Dijakovic, right? Feast your eyes. Feast your eyes on me, motherfucker. This show was fucking garbage. Absolutely fucking garbage. And that pains me to say when I got Ricochet, Alistair Black, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa's fucking picture looking right at me. Monday Night Raw, Lafayette, Louisiana. We're going to go over everything that happened on tonight's show, which was basically nothing. We have a major pay-per-view coming up in three weeks. There was no even mention of Fastlane. WrestleMania is 49 days away. No build towards WrestleMania outside of Rollins and Lesnar via a video package. And then a mention of Charlotte and Ronda Rousey with a, a brief mention of Becky Lynch and what she did this weekend. Outside that... Nothing else was even put in place for WrestleMania. We're going to go over all that, what I thought of all the NXT matches on tonight's show, and everything else that happened on Raw in just a little bit, man. If you guys missed my Elimination Chamber review and results video, man, please go and check that out. Link is in the annotation that you see in the top right corner of your screen, along with everything else that you might have missed this past weekend, including off the script, preview predictions, 
We got Batista in talks with both WWE and AEW. The Elimination Chamber review was about an hour in length. Over 2,000 likes, 35,000 views after 24 hours. Thank you guys so very much. Resident Evil 2 live stream tomorrow. Make sure you guys come out for that. I go one-on-one -on -one with that mutant alligator. And man, that thing scared the fucking living shit out of me, man. So make sure you guys tune into that tomorrow at 4 p.m. Off the script this past weekend. And then obviously the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view review live on the channel right now. Thank you guys so very much for showing all your support on all the content on the channel. The new shirt is just basically on the brink of 100 sold in the first two and a half weeks of its campaign, man. You guys are absolutely killing it. Off the Script is now exclusively working with Bonfire.com. We are at 97 sold with these t-shirts, man. We need three more. Can someone out there bring me to the $100 or the 100 uh, shirt limit, rather? Can we get to 100? I would love if that actually happened tonight. I would love to wake up tomorrow morning with my phone just telling me you hit your goal of 100, man. Let's try and break 100. So if you guys want to go get your shirt, man, JD's Elite right now exclusively available on bonfire.com. Link will be down in the description towards the very top. You will see it there. Make sure you guys go and get yours today. Follow me on social media, man. JD from NY206. I was live tweeting like a motherfucker tonight during Monday Night Raw for better or worse. Follow me on Instagram as well. We just hit over 6,100 followers on Instagram. JD from NY206. Follow me on Twitch, man. I'll probably be on Twitch tomorrow. I think the new Black Ops 4 update's coming out with uh, new weapons and a new operation and blackout and all that shit. On Twitch, JD from New York, and hit that subscribe button as well uh, with that bell. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If you guys want to support the podcast on Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Thank you guys so very much for all of that. Lafayette, Louisiana. They wanted to come to a wrestling show to sit on their hands and make absolutely no noise, man. I think I had more of a reaction to my grandfather's fucking funeral, God rest his soul, than I seen in Lafayette, Louisiana tonight. Why? I, someone actually told me WWE was giving away three for one. I don't know if that's the case, but Jesus Christ, I hope that is in the news sometime this week. I would love to know why this crowd did not fucking care about anybody. And I love the fucking imbeciles, the cretins on social media who want to throw NXT in my face. Oh, NXT is garbage. NXT sucks. Vanilla midgets. They got no reaction. JD is salty because his boys got no reaction. Motherfucker, Sasha, ba Sasha Banks and Bailey just won the, the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships and they came out to library silence tonight. So don't blame it on just my boys in NXT, you gotta look at the full fucking picture, you unintelligent fucking social media cretins that hide behind your iconic fucking avatars, you fucking clowns. Go fucking back to your holes, you oxygen thieves, you fucking idiots. God, man, social media makes me dumber by the fucking week. Honestly. Monday Night Raw, Lafayette, Louisiana. Triple H is in the ring. Triple, it's nice to see Triple H start the show instead of Stephanie or Vince or Shane. Triple H is a little bit more comforting in sound of his voice and just the sight of him. Because we know that when Triple H is there, it's a little bit more of what we want to see. And I would not be shocked if Meltzer or Alvarez come out and report that Triple H had a big hand creatively in everything regarding the NXT talents tonight. And that Vince McMahon gave him the reins for his guys on this night for Monday Night Raw. Came out, talked about the Elimination Chamber. He gave props to a few of the performances on Sunday night. Sasha Banks and Bayley making history, becoming the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. And that was the right move. No question about it. They were the two best for that role to be inaugural WWE Tag Team Champions. 
We got Finn Balor winning the Intercontinental Championship. Kofi Kingston creating magic and captivating the WWE Universe against Daniel Bryan in the Elimination Chamber. Becky Lynch, even though she suspended Becky Lynch, and he did, he did give her props for what she did at the Elimination Chamber against Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch, but he says that he's got to be a little bit more professional in his stance here. If it does happen again, she will be arrested and prosecuted by the law if she does do it again. Seven days from now, Becky Lynch will be arrested and prosecuted for crashing Ric Flair's birthday party. Mark my words. Then he goes on to mention that Degeneration X is going into the Hall of Fame for 2019. He mentions everybody from X-Pac, Sean Waltman, Road Dogg, Billy Gun- uh, Road Dogg, uh, Brian James, and Billy Gunn. He-, he mentions HBK, obviously, and he mentions China. Now, everybody on social media, you know, wrestling community on Twitter and social media on YouTube, we're a very opinionated group of people. And I would like to consider myself uh, one of the front runners in leading the charge for the wrestling community. But the things that I see on social media, man, sometimes I pick my battles. And sometimes you got to pick your battles very wisely. This is why I waited for tonight to talk about this. I didn't make a video. I didn't tweet about it. I didn't give my opinion on social media. Uh, I wanted to wait for this specific review because there really isn't anything for me to say. I'm not going to sit there for 10 minutes in a long-winded video going over why I think D-Generation X deserves to be in the Hall of Fame or why China should be going in herself. And this was the argument of everybody. Nobody's happy with anything, ever. And that's more prominent in wrestling Twitter than anything. People were complaining that China is not going in by herself for the Hall of Fame. Who the fuck cares? Honestly, who cares? Most of what she did as far as importance to the women's revolution was in Degeneration X, in my honest opinion. And people are complaining that, oh, they're not putting her in the Hall of Fame by herself. Again, who cares? As long as she's going in the Hall of Fame. As long as China is being acknowledged in the WWE Hall of Fame. I don't know why people need to create this outrage for absolutely no reason on social media about China. Like, she's in the Hall of Fame. She was a part of one of the biggest stables in the history of pro wrestling. Why wouldn't you be happy for her to be acknowledged in this instance? I genuinely don't understand the logic of people. And this was the big outcry on social media. Nobody's ever happy with anything. Just be fortunate enough that WWE is including China with Degeneration X because they could have easily just put in HBK, Triple H, and the New Age Outlaws. I don't see anybody crying that Rick Rude isn't there. Now, if we really want to fucking make an outrage, Rick Rude was a part of DX. Where the fuck is ravishing Rick Rude? Point proven. Pick your battles wisely. People want to complain about China. I'm raising your stakes here. Where the fuck is ravishing Rick Rude? Give me a break. We got bigger things to worry about. China is in the Hall of Fame. Maybe one day will get China going in by herself. And people will acknowledge all the things that she did by herself. Degeneration X gave her a foot in the door. There would be no China without Degeneration X. Just let that fucking sink in. Anyway. You know, Owen Hart's not in the Hall of Fame. Every single year. WWE cannot put Owen Hart in the Hall of Fame. And every single year, WWE wants to put in somebody who in the previous year has passed away. China should be alive and be inducted into the Hall of Fame. 
She should. This should have happened years ago. Same thing happened with Vader. Vader passed away. Tweeted out that he's got two years to live. Now look. Still not in the Hall of Fame. Same thing happened with Randy Savage. Same thing happened with Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Jim the Anvil Nightheart passed away recently. Hart Foundation wasn't in the Hall of Fame. Now he won't be able to be there to accept the honor. WWE's Hall of Fame is a joke. It's a fucking joke. I, I genuinely, that, that's the one thing that I don't watch during WrestleMania weekend. Because it's a fucking joke. Uh, it's, it's not important to me. It really isn't. I don't need a Hall of Fame to prove to me who's a Hall of Famer or not. I've been watching this product for over 30 fucking years. I know who's a Hall of Famer and who's not based on the amount of WWE I've watched in my lifetime. I know China is a Hall of Famer. I don't need WWE to acknowledge to me that China is a Hall of Famer. Fuck out of here. I know Owen Hart's a Hall of Famer. I know Vader is a Hall of Famer. I know the Hart Foundation are Hall of Famers. Demolitions, not even in the fucking Hall of Fame. One of the greatest tag teams of all time. Hall of Fame's a joke. They didn't really, they didn't really even make a big deal about Degeneration X. It was a video package and that was it. Seems like WWE is dummying down the Hall of Fame this year. But whatever the case may be, what the fuck is there to complain about? Again, you're lucky that she's even being acknowledged with Degeneration X. Moving on. Triple H then went into the WrestleMania 35 season. He brings up how he is running NXT. He's proud to introduce four of NXT superstars. We get Ricochet, Aleister Black, Johnny Gargano, and Tommaso Ciampa. Video packages of each with looked like, uh, I don't know if it was pre-recorded comments from Michael Cole going over each individual and what they bring to the table. I'm going to tell you right now, Michael Cole announcing for Aleister Black, DIY, and Ricochet just will never, ever, ever sit well with me. His voice does not go with anything that any four of those men do. Michael Cole is old school. Michael Cole's been there for over 20 years. These guys, these four are the future of the business. I don't want Michael Cole to, to do anything regarding all four of these men. We need a new voice to lead the new generation of WWE. Michael Cole is not it. Michael Cole is not it. There's a report going around. Someone asked Meltzer about Michael Cole when he's going to be able to step down or when he's going to step down from his duties as lead play-by-play man on Monday Night Raw. Now, Meltzer reported that there was plans in place for Michael Cole to quit or retire or step down and take more of a backstage role and teach the commentators. We've been hearing about this for two years now. We've been hearing about this since the first ever United Kingdom Championship Tournament where he called one of his best nights ever, in my opinion, with Nigel McGuinness. We've been hearing it since then. And now, we're in 2019 and Michael Cole is still here. It is obviously one of those things that I will believe it when I hear his voice no longer on Monday Night Raw. But hearing him just go over the accolades and what makes all four of these men important, was just fucking cancer to my ears. Awful. So we got all that, and we got the DIY revival announcements. We got Ricochet and Aleister Black scheduled to be in action on Monday Night Raw. So we lead Monday Night Raw with all these positive announcements to zero reaction from the crowd. Even the Degeneration X announcement didn't receive anything as far as reaction from Lafayette, Louisiana. So we got this new, this bright, this promising intro to Monday Night Raw. And what does WWE do to open the show? Baron Corbin versus Braun Strowman. And you guessed it, a gimmick match. Braun Strowman versus Baron Corbin in a tables match that was absolutely identical to what they did at the Elimination Chamber. 
move for move, sequence for sequence, spot for spot, the basis of this match was primarily the same exact thing that we got on Sunday night at the Elimination Chamber, which, again, bodes or, or yields the question, why do pay-per-views in WWE mean anything anymore if we're only going to get a rematch under a different stipulation, but it's kind of the same thing on Monday Night Raw? Um, there's no difference between a no-DQ match and a tables match. Both stipulations yield no disqualification, and the only difference is you have to put your opponent through a table to win the match in a tables match. But other than that, it's still a no disqualification match. I don't understand why we had to see this again on Monday Night Raw. And everything that happened to Braun Strowman at the Elimination Chamber, the post-match attack, putting him through the double tables with the shield powerbomb, what was it for? What was the meaning? What was the meaning of, of that post-match attack? Why was that necessary for Braun Strowman to only come back here and beat Baron Corbin on Monday Night Raw? It's ridiculous. I want to know one person who is genuinely interested in this garbage. Who? I, I, I don't get it. I genuinely don't have any interest in anything that Braun Strowman or Baron Corbin are doing on Monday Night Raw. And here's the best part. They put Baron Corbin with Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre. They got these three guys back together, similar to what they did to close 2019. At the same time, they took Drew McIntyre away from Dolph Ziggler only to align him with someone or people who are worse than Dolph Ziggler. Wasn't Drew McIntyre supposed to be the leader of Monday Night Raw? Wasn't he supposed to be head and shoulders above everybody else? What is Drew McIntyre doing as someone's lackey? He's following Baron Corbin instead of going out on his own, wanting to break free and prove to everybody that this is his show. Absolutely asinine backwards writing for Drew McIntyre. So when people start saying, oh, Drew McIntyre is boring, you can look back to this fucking creative by them aligning him with Baron Corbin and, and Bobby Lashley in this long, drawn-out feud that should have ended back in November, and we're still seeing it in February. You can reference this fucking feud. This was absolutely god-awful. I don't understand... How anyone can find any interest right now in Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman did the same exact spot that he did at the Elimination Chamber. He set the table up in the corner, running power slam through the table, and that was it. Braun Strowman beats Baron Corbin after being demolished at the Elimination Chamber, wiping out the post-match, or, or the, I guess the, the ma in-match attack. I thought it was a post-match attack. I forgot that there was no DQ. Braun Strowman wins, and nobody fucking cared. Braun Strowman makes his way backstage, and out comes Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman makes his way to the stage. Now, you might, you might have noticed on Monday Night Raw that WWE, instead of going to commercial after a match is over, they kind of bleed into the next segment. So, for, for example, Braun Strowman is walking up the ramp, and then it's the start of the next segment, which in this case was Paul Heyman. He comes on out, and then they go to commercial. So they give you a visual of what's to come, and then they go to commercial, trying to hook the viewer onto what's coming next so that you sit around and wait for the end of the commercials. That's what they're doing that for. So Heyman is out there with a microphone. He is selling the choke job that Braun Strowman gave him. Braun Strowman grabbed him by the neck, Heyman started yelling, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I'm just an advocate. And we go to commercial. After commercial, Heyman's got a microphone, he says he can't say he's surprised by Braun Strowman's actions. He says everyone should be jealous of his client's actions because his client is the most dominant in WWE and MMA. Heyman says this is why he put together something to educate everyone on his clients. Brock Lesnar. Heyman points to the big screen, and we see a video package with the advocate, Paul Heyman, talking up his client, mentioning the upcoming WrestleMania 35 main event, 
with Seth Rollins. Heyman talks about our hero, Rollins, who has no hope this time. The video goes on previewing the match with Heyman praising Lesnar. And then after it's all over, Heyman's in the ring. And he goes on a burn it down chant, trying to get people to chant along. Now, I don't know if this was successful or not. I really wasn't paying that much attention because the crowd had me in a very depressive state to a point where I wanted to hang myself above my couch. But whether they sang along or not to the burn it, chant, uh, burn it down chant, Heyman says there's not enough fire to burn down Suplex City. I actually like that line. Music hits and out comes Finn Balor to interrupt. Balor makes his way and just like the Paul Heyman segment, we see Balor come out, the new Intercontinental Champion, and they go to commercial. So now we're going to see Finn Balor in the ring talking about the Intercontinental Championship and what happened at the Elimination Chamber. So Balor's in the ring. And he's talking about winning a one-on-two handicap match over Leo Rush and Bobby Trashley. Balor says it's been a while since he's held one of these titles. And boy, does it feel good. And for some reason, I LOL'd at the tone that Finn Balor used here. As if he was mocking WWE. Well, holy shit, it's about fucking time I got one of these titles. Feels good, he says. Goes on mentioning growing up, watching the greats like Reza Ramon, Shawn Michaels, and Ric Flair. Says it's been a dream to hold this title. And he says it's proud to continue the legacy as our Intercontinental Champion. He went on to say he was planning on defending this title at... And then Leo Rush comes out to the stage. And he's got a microphone in his hand. Rush goes on to say Balor doesn't deserve to be Intercontinental Champion... Lashley does. Lashley suddenly attacks Balor from behind in the ring. Lashley then unloads on Balor and stomps away while the champion is down. Rush is ordering Lashley to just beat him up as Rush climbs the turnbuckle and delivers a split-legged frog splash off the top onto the new Intercontinental Champion. Out comes Rick O'Shea. And he helps... Finn Balor in the cause here, and we go to commercial break. So Ricochet nails Lashley from the apron, hits a moonsault on Leo Rush to the floor, and we got ourselves a tag team match. Now, I was just like everybody else in hoping that it was going to be Ricochet versus Finn Balor for the Intercontinental Championship. I would have loved that. And I'm actually glad that that didn't happen. I'm glad that we didn't see too much of our fantasies becoming a reality on this show because this crowd didn't deserve a goddamn fucking thing. And I would have been absolutely fucking more angry than I am tonight if we got Finn Balor and Ricochet in front of this crowd on this night on Monday Night Raw. I'm glad we didn't get it. Now, I was a little upset here. Everybody else got their own entrance and everybody else got... Time to shine and show everybody what their entrance is. Aleister Black's got a great entrance. Tommaso Champ and Johnny Gargano got great entrances. We didn't get to see Ricochet. Ricochet's entrance is a big part of his act. And we didn't get to see that on Monday Night Raw. I even tweeted out that this was a huge wasted opportunity for Ricochet in his debut on Monday Night Raw. And that's what I should have specified in my tweet on Twitter tonight. I didn't like that he just ran down the aisle. We heard his theme music briefly play for about three seconds, and he's in there flipping and diving and taking out Leo Rush and Bobby Lashley. I wanted Ricochet to be treated just like everybody else that was being showcased tonight, and he just ran down to save Finn Balor. Now, yes, it it did make for a great moment, but I, I can't help but feel it was a wasted opportunity for Ricochet. Now, the match itself wasn't even that bad. The match itself was actually very good. Surprising that Bobby Lashley was associated with this thing. But it was actually a very good tag team match. The dynamic of Ricochet and Finn Balor teaming up was a great thing to see. And I love tag team matches. And when you got tag team matches that include Finn Balor and Ricochet, guys like Leo Rush who mix well with Balor and Ricochet, Lashley who's there, 
who's strong and dominating and, and can throw guys like Ricochet and Balor around him made for a very good dynamic. And I'm going to do something that I really don't do all that often here. This was this was probably Bobby Lashley's best match on the main roster since he has been back with WWE. I thought this was great. Now, the crowd itself, they didn't give a fuck about anything, and it pained my fucking soul to see Ricochet do his handspring backflip in the middle of the ring where he shows off, and it got no reaction. I didn't like that at all. I don't know what the fuck they were waiting for. You know? They, they could have had a live sex scene with fucking Johnny Sins and Lisa Ann in the middle of the ring, and these people would have been sitting there with fucking just uh, sleepy eyes. You know? It's ridiculous. I don't know what the fuck they were waiting for. Anyway, very good tag team match. Uh, Lashley was throwing around Ricochet, throwing around Balor. Uh, Bobby Lashley was taking care of Finn Balor getting his revenge or extracting some revenge from the loss at the Elimination Chamber. Leo Rush stopped Finn Balor from making the tag to Ricochet. That was the match. Pretty much Ricochet getting the hot tag. Lashley, at the end of this thing, scooped Balor for a powerbomb, but Balor fights out of it, slides out, does a double stomp on Bobby Lashley's chest, and Ricochet waits for the tag, and he finally gets it after a... Very significant amount of time where Ricochet sat on the corner here in this match. Ricochet comes in. He takes out Leo Rush. Neck breaker and a shoulder in the corner. Ricochet springboards in with a big drop kick to Rush. Ricochet also takes Lashley down. Ricochet runs the ropes and leaps over the top, taking Rush down to the floor. Lashley backs Ricochet up to the floor, and Ricochet and Ballard team up to take Lashley down on the outside. Ricochet springboards in on Rush with that springboard European uppercut, and then he goes to the top for a picture-perfect 630. Some reaction to the 630, because I don't know how one can just sit there and not react to the 630. He hits the 630 on Leo Rush for the win and the pin. Great match here, and Balor put over Ricochet at the end of this thing by giving him the spotlight in the ring, and Balor gave, uh, like I said, Ricochet a spotlight in the middle of the ring and walked out and left Ricochet in the ring by himself. Man, a really nice moment there. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I don't give a shit what anybody says about Ricochet, he, he is, uh, his athleticism, or he's nothing but a gymnast who does flips and dives. Ricochet has some work to do on the microphone. Yes, I am fully aware of that. He, he's not bad to a point where he's unlistenable. But Ricochet is going to be an absolute megastar on the main roster. Just picture AJ Styles a, a, a lot younger. Th this is what I picture with Ricochet. There's, there's absolutely zero chance that WWE can fuck Ricochet up. The guy is absolutely breathtaking, and I see huge things for Ricochet in the WWE. And this was only the beginning of Mr. Ricochet on the main roster. I'd love to see Balor and Ricochet one-on-one -on -one somewhere down the line, and maybe this year we'll get it for the Intercontinental Championship. Natalia is backstage talking to Triple H when Drew McIntyre walks in and interrupts. Now, immediately when Aleister Black was scheduled for a match tonight, I'm thinking of two people. I'm thinking, man, would I love to see Aleister Black versus Seth Rollins in the main event of Monday Night Raw, or I'd love to see Aleister Black versus Drew McIntyre. And Drew McIntyre actually mentioned, you know, you're rolling out the red carpet for all these NXT guys, he says to Triple H. He said, well, what about me? You know, I want Rollins or the Universal Champion Brock Lesnar. I want to show you that I am the man here. Drew tells Triple H, give me Rollins tonight so I can prove it to you. Dean Ambrose comes in and he walks up to Drew McIntyre and says, I'm not doing anything tonight. What about me? And he smacks Drew right across the face and then walks off. Triple H then says, did you still want me to make the match with Seth Rollins? And, and Drew McIntyre says, make the match with Ambrose. So there you go. So we got Ambrose and Drew McIntyre tonight on Monday Night Raw. Pretty entertaining stuff by Dean Ambrose and Drew McIntyre with Triple H involved. Lucha House Party. Versus Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. You know, they got Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins back to help the tag team division. But WWE is doing nothing to help out Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. They got 
what is known as the jobber entrance, meaning that we don't see their entrance on television. When we get back from commercial, they're already in the ring ready to go. So they got absolutely no entrance, and it goes to show you what WWE thinks of the team of Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. The Lucha Clown Party are another team on Monday Night Raw that I absolutely can't fucking stand, and I wish that they would go away, but here we are. Nonetheless, the Lucha Clown Party, with their fucking pinata, against two losers in Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. Great. Great. I'm fucking excited. I can't wait, man. I can't, I, I can hardly contain my excitement here. Lucha House Party wins. Uh, we had uh, Hawkins come in. He showed some fire here. He wanted to end that losing streak. Nails Dorado, then knocks Metallic off the apron. This leads to Lindsay Dorado taking advantage and getting the pin on Kurt Hawkins. After the match, Lucha House Party celebrates as their music hits the PA. Who cares? Who cares? Unless you're serving fucking tequila and a margarita, I don't give a fuck. Go away. Seriously, go away. Charlie Caruso brings heavy machinery out to the stage. Tucker and Otis. It's no longer Tucker Knight and Otis Dojovic. No, no, no. They butchered the, their last name. So they're now just Tucker and Otis. Charlie Caruso says, We've seen them compete on Raw and SmackDown, and they have been very impressive. I would agree. I, I actually expected a lot worse from Heavy Machinery, but they've actually done pretty well for themselves so far, considering all things that are Monday Night Raw. She then asks, what can we expect from both of them? Tucker says that they're blue-collar salad, that uh, they are known for getting the job done, says Tucker. I hope so. I hope that we can reference this promo and go back and really feel what Tucker Knight was trying to say here. And then Otis comes in and agrees. And he mentions stakes and weights, stakes and weights, Tucker, Tucker, stakes and weights, Tucker. Gotta love Otis. Quite the character is Otis. And all of a sudden, we get Lacey Evans coming on out. And I, I believe she, she might have gotten uh, a Victoria's Secret model fucking uh, showcase mixed up with Monday Night Raw. She's coming down. She's wearing this nice outfit. She's got her fucking uh, Southern Belle hat on. She's walking down with her purse all primp and proper. Otis is standing there like fucking, uh, he's just mesmerized. He's got uh, his tongue out. He, I've visibly seen Otis drooling over the sight of Lacey Evans. So she comes out and does the same exact thing that she did at the Elimination Chamber. She walks down the aisle, and she gets halfway down the aisle, and she says, fuck it, you don't deserve to see me. I'm going right to the back, right back to catering. I hear that they're serving uh, half and half lemonades, some Arnold Palmers in Titus catering, because it's got that nice southern feel, you know? And they had some gumbo I heard in catering, too. I don't know if Titus is catering, uh, or if Titus catering has award-winning gumbo, but from what I heard, Apollo Crews loves the chocolate chip cookies. He actually tweeted this on, on, on Twitter. Cookies and catering, yum. So obviously I had to say something. And what I told him is, man, Apollo, I hear that they're the best in town. Man, Titus's cookies must be fucking out of this world. I gotta, I gotta get my hands on, on the recipe. Lacey Evans obviously wanted some fucking cookies. She was in and out. Uh, heavy Machinery seen Lacey Evans doing her model runway walk, and they walked the, the runway with Lacey Evans looking on, and they did the old bushwhackers. You know, uh, if there's one team you should be imitating, it is not the bushwhackers. Just throwing that out there. I don't know if, I don't know if that uh, bodes well for uh, the team of Otis and Tucker. We see my boys, man. Tommaso Ciampa's beard looking all majestic. Johnny Gargano backstage with the North American Championship. Tommaso Ciampa obviously had Goldie, the NXT Championship. Rude and Gable come up to congratulate DIY on their main roster debuts. I don't know why you're congratulating anybody. This is Monday Night Raw, Mr. Gable. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is the worst show that WWE puts on. Why you're congratulating anyone for being here is uh, just foolish. Absolutely foolish. 
So Rude and Gable congratulate DIY on their main roster debuts. They also wonder why it's DIY getting the shot at the Revival when it should be them. Now, I really don't understand this, uh, this line here by Chad Gable. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Shane McMahon say that there will be no automatic rematch clauses? That it is an antiquated situation to give out rematch clauses or to give a rematch to a champion that just lost the title. So why is Gable standing here in front of Champa and Gargano so misinformed and so confused? Was he not there? Did he have his face stuffed in some cheesecake and catering when Shane McMahon made this announcement several weeks ago? It's like WWE doesn't realize what they scripted on Monday Night Raw about five or six weeks ago. I don't understand it. You have to work your... And then he goes right back into his, his spiel telling that when you get to the main roster, you got to work yourself from the bottom all the way up. Well, there you go, Gable. You answered your own fucking question. The reason why you lost the titles was because the Revival was the better team. Now you're at the bottom of the barrel. Now you got to work yourself back up. It's not that difficult, Mr. Gable. Maybe uh, you aren't so glorious. Jesus Christ. Anyway, we had Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. They did not seem too interested in what Gable has to say. I'm surprised they were even interested in being on this fucking show. Gargano mentions how they came to take over the main roster. After running NXT for two years, the Revival walks up and interrupts, mentioning how they did come up from the bottom. Yes, by complaining. You complained, and now you're the Raw Tag Team Champions. You complained about wanting more competition. You want your release to go to AEW, and now you're the Raw Tag Team Champions. So there you go. You didn't really work from the bottom up. You just complained, and they rewarded you because they didn't want you to go to the competition. Champa interrupts and says, listen, we're not here for this nonsense. We're here to make an impression, okay? And we're looking to make an impression at your expense. Champa wishes them good luck, and the Revival downplay the pressure and head off to the ring, telling DIY that we'll see you out there. Now, I have to admit, yes, this is in Lafayette, Louisiana. I was hoping that uh, these guys were going to tear the house down. I was wrong. And Lafayette, Louisiana didn't deserve these four men in the ring. The Revival and DIY put on the greatest tag team title match that I think I've ever seen at TakeOver Toronto in November of 2016. And here we are getting a rematch on Monday Night Raw. Now, I would be lying to you if I did not mark out with the graphic of Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa versus Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder. I would be lying. Now, I know this is Monday Night Raw, and I know that this was not a good show, but when I first seen the announcement that this match was taking place, I'm like, okay, this is fucking great. This is what we need to see on Monday Night Raw. Good old-fashioned tag team wrestling. Folks, the future is here with Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. If you do not understand that, maybe you should go get yourself mentally checked, okay? So we got this tag team match. The tag team match did not even come close to what I remember these two guys, or these four guys, rather, these four guys doing in November of 2016. It is Monday Night Raw, after all. But, but, I was excited to see it, and I have to give criticism, even though they're my boys. All four of these guys are my boys. But the creative decision for this match was fucking ridiculous. Okay, you got... Realistically, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, yes, they're the North American and NXT champions, respectively. But they are the new faces on the main roster. And I had everybody, from Jesse to my best friend Pete, to my commentary partner at House of Glory, Ben Venuto, all thinking the same thing as me. We were all on the same wavelength. The ending of this match was absolutely fucking terrible. And I don't know why the Revival just won the Tag Team Championships last week in a great match from Rude and Gable and then come right back the next week and lose to Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. Now, 
Yes, it is Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, but they're relatively unknowns on Monday Night Raw. Now, if WWE wanted to book this in a way in which it continued some storylines going into the big NXT show that we're going to see this Wednesday on the WWE Network, I would have been okay with it. Or if WWE wanted to book Gable and Rude interfering in this thing, causing a disqualification, I would have been okay with it. You know, the Velveteen Dream was uh, uh, just bizarrely absent from this show, and I don't know why. Of all people, you know, he's right in there, in the mix of things with Ricochet and Aleister Black and Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. Velveteen Dream was noticeably absent on this Monday Night Raw. You figured that he would be a part of something like this. I, I'm actually glad that he wasn't. But if there was ever a fucking spot for the Velveteen Dream, it would have been in this match. There's no way that Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano should have won this match clean. None. Not over the Raw Tag Team Champions. Now, if they wanted to make some sense of this, they could have had Dream interfere in this match and cause a disqualification and build towards the North American Championship match, which was a great match because I was there, at Full Sail on Wednesday between Dream and Gargano. And WWE didn't do anything like that. They just sent the Revival out there and they lost clean. Now, maybe the Revival didn't mind dropping this match to, to DIY. Maybe they didn't care. Maybe maybe they were just happy that, listen, we got fucking two of the best guys in, in tag team wrestling right now standing across the ring from us. Two of the best guys that this company has right now standing in the ring with us. This is what we wanted. So we can't really complain all that much. Maybe they didn't give, even give a shit. But the logic of it, from where I was sitting and from everywhere else, where everybody else was sitting, texting me, we all thought the same thing. There's no way that DIY should have won this match clean. Some sort of interference causing a DQ, an interference on the outside from Gable, Rude, or Dream, which would have made a ton of sense, should have happened. So when everybody wants to sit there and say, oh, JD is an NXT dick rider, there's nothing about NXT he complains about, you can reference this video and see me telling you that they booked Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa in the wrong way. They should not have won this match on Monday Night Raw. Charlie Caruso is backstage with Ricochet and Finn Balor. Balor says that he had a big night at the Elimination Chamber, but tonight it's all about this man, and he points to Ricochet. Balor steps away and gives Ricochet the spotlight again with Charlie Caruso. Ricochet says he's living his dream and achieving his goals, saying it feels better than anything he could ever imagine. Ricochet goes on and says that you know, I could sit here and, and talk to you for days and tell you how I feel, but if you think that this is the last you've seen of me, we're just seeing the beginning. Ricochet says he will prove to the world why there is only one of the one and only, and he walks off. So I'm excited about the future of all four of these guys, but again, tonight was not the night for any of them to debut on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Owens was, again, in another pre-recorded segment. I forgot to mention this on the Elimination Chamber review. Kevin Owens was actually uh, filming himself picking up a pizza for his family. And I don't know what was on the pizza. Maybe it was bacon or pepperoni and pineapple. Uh, I'm telling you all right now, pineapple does not belong on pizza. There is something mentally fucked up with you if you're going to put hot pineapple on cheese pizza with any type of meat. Pineapple does not... I love pineapple. Don't get me wrong, man. Pineapple is one of my favorite fruits, but it does not belong on a pizza at all. So uh, let, let's end that discussion right now. For all you pineapple-loving pizza lovers out there, uh, I don't care who I've made salty with that comment. That's just my personal opinion. God bless you if you love pineapple on your pizza. It's not for me. Especially a fucking kid from the Bronx growing up, right? You know, you go to the corner fucking store, the, the corner pizzeria. Hey, 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 so can I get uh, a, a cheese slice and can I get a pepperoni, please? And make sure you got, uh, you know, the garlic knots as well. You know, give me a break. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about pizza. I'm here to talk about how Bailey and Sasha Banks came out to fucking funeral silence while they showed off the new WWE Women's Tag Team Championships. Oh, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm skipping all over the fucking place here. Uh, Kevin Owens was in this pre-recorded video at a movie theater with his son. And Owens is talking about his training. He's a couple of weeks away from returning. He's spending time with his family. He's watching WWE TV. He's never been more focused. He's never been more hungrier. 
as he's eating popcorn in the movie theater, yada, yada, yada. His son brings him popcorn and a soda, and Owens asks for the change back. And I'm like, well, I gave you a fucking 20. Where is it? And then his son says, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? So there you go. Owens is the father of the year. Just letting his son get away with anything. So Bailey and Sasha Banks, they make their way to the ring. And nobody could uh, legitimately give a flying fuck about these two. When when people want to tell me that uh, the NXT guys got uh, radio silence on this show, just look at Bailey and Sasha Banks, two of the most popular females in the entire company, got absolutely zero reaction. So Bailey can't believe that they're standing here with the titles. Get over it, honey. You won it, now you got to defend it. Banks says that this feels like a dream, but it's definitely real. They really did this. Banks talks about how crazy it is to see how far that they've come. From NXT to making history together. They go on about not being afraid. About having the same dreams, visions, and goals. Banks says that they put their hearts and souls into the women's division. And they will face anyone, anywhere. Whether it's on Raw, SmackDown, or NXT. Okay? And I'm already envisioning EO and Kyrie Sane. EO Shirai and Kyrie Sane. The Sky Pirates. I'm also envisioning the team of Bailey and Sasha Banks when Tegan Knox gets better, Team Kick, and Dakota Kai is out with injury too. I'm envisioning uh, the Boston Hug Connection versus Team Kick, Tegan Knox, and Dakota Kai down in NXT. Take my money, man. Take my money. So then out comes Tamina Snuka and Nia Jax. Whoever gave Tamina Snuka a microphone must have been on drugs. I don't know why you would send this woman out to a live audience with a fucking microphone. Maybe they mistaken it for a big piece of fucking salami. I don't know. Nia Jax mocks the champions and tells them to stop crying. Jax congratulates them and says that they are cute and they're matching outfits, but they don't get it. I don't get why you're on TV. How about that one? They go on trash talking as they walk to the ring. Jax points at how Banks always loses her titles on her first defense. Really? You're going to poke fun at Sasha Banks losing titles on her first defense, which is a fact. But uh, you should not be making fun of anybody because you are completely miserable in between the ropes. Snooker then takes the microphone and sends a warning. Um, I, I, I sends a, I, I, everybody's got a fucking warning when she opens her mouth. Everybody should get a fucking warning when she jumps off the top rope too. Have you seen her super fly splash? Fucking god awful. Snooker sends a warning saying that they got lucky last night, but their luck is about to run out. Man, I would be so lucky that I don't have to fucking see you at all ever again. Let alone with a fucking microphone in your hand. So they rush to the ring, and Banks and Bailey fight them off. They try and fight Bailey and Sasha Banks, and then all of a sudden, we get Banks grabbing Jax and applies a bank statement from under the bottom rope, but Snooker pulls her to safety. Jackson Snooker retreat up the ramp, and that was it. So, wh- wh- what is it? Wh- 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 what was the point of this? You completely made Nia Jackson and Tamina Snooker look like a bunch of cowards. L- like, do you want to fight them, or you don't want them to fight them? Or, or you don't want to fight them? You're so big, so bad, so tough, get in the fucking ring. Or maybe Titus had the wafting smell of fucking linguine and clam sauce roaming around the fucking backstage area and you wanted to fucking run back to catering. Had to be. Because your luck is about to run out, says Tamina Snugger. Apparently, the linguine and clam sauce was going to be eaten by Apollo Crews. He had enough of the fucking cookies. Dean Ambrose versus Drew McIntyre. People, all I have to say about this match is this. Seriously, I I would love a logical reason as to why we seen Drew McIntyre bury Dean Ambrose with a Claymore kick. This was about two minutes, if not around three minutes, two, three minutes. The week before, we had Drew McIntyre in and around Braun Strowman's business with Baron Corbin and Bobby Lashley. 
Meanwhile, Dean Ambrose was taking on EC3. Now, Drew McIntyre did nothing as far as helping Baron Corbin tonight. That seemingly was forgotten. And Dean Ambrose beat EC3 last week on Monday Night Raw. He beat EC3, a man who is leaving the company, willingly beat EC3, who is an NXT call-up, an up-and-comer in the WWE with a fairly easy roll-up victory. Can someone please tell me why Ambrose beat EC3 last week only to be squashed this week? What does the win over EC3 do for Dean Ambrose? So, I'm sitting here wondering where EC3 is. Why has EC3 been given the shaft? Why he has a loss on his record already as far as call-ups go. Nobody else really, Nikki Cross lost. You could probably lump this into the Nikki Cross situation too. Nikki Cross was fed to Ruby Riot only for Ruby Riot to lose to Ronda Rousey in 90 seconds. What did the win over EC3 do for Monday Night Raw and Dean Ambrose? If this was the end result. It's as if they grew brain dead in the seven days that followed last week's show. I don't know. Drew McIntyre wins with the Claymore kick. Charlie Caruso's backstage with Seth Rollins, and she asks about the video package that Paul Heyman's been playing. Rollins says you can call Paul Heyman a lot of things, but he's not a liar. Vince McMahon's a liar, though. This is not a new era, folks. I don't know. I'm still waiting for this new era. Everything he just said about Brock Lesnar is the truth. Rollins says he's not walking into WrestleMania with a death wish. He's accepting his fate. Rollins goes on and says Lesnar's reign of terror is done. Regarding his own fate, Rollins says if he leaves on his own feet or on a stretcher, he promises he's leaving WrestleMania with the Universal Championship. You know, I wouldn't be so quick to bet against Brock Lesnar. I have this sneaking suspicion that we're going to see what we seen last year with Roman Reigns. At this juncture, I'm going with Brock Lesnar to retain the Universal Championship. That's just me. I don't know how you guys are feeling about this. I'm not liking this angle whatsoever. I'm just not finding myself invested in what they're trying to tell here. I I don't know what it is. It's as if this title is doomed to just be uninteresting in every situation that it's put in. Dean Ambrose then appears out of nowhere. Rollins then asks, can I help you? Ambrose then says, where were you out there? Rollins, it looked like he was trying to hide what was laughter at that line. Rollins then says, have you completely lost your mind? Ambrose then looks a little bit confused. He's looking around. He shrugs off and says, maybe. And he walks away. It took every bit of the muscles in Rollins' face not to fucking either crack a smile or laugh at the just sheer stupidity that Dean Ambrose showcased in this segment. It's a man that don't give a fuck, folks. You can see it all over his body language. He does not give a fuck. Alistair Black versus Elias. Elias was in the ring. And as soon as he shrummed the cord and I seen the time, I'm like, Alistair Black's going to come out and black mass Elias, isn't he? And that's exactly what happened. Elias says he will do a song tonight, but it's not for the fans. It's for himself in hopes that He can slip into a deep consciousness. Uh, I think this entire show beforehand made everybody slip into a deep fucking state of slumber because there was no fucking sound or motion from these people for three hours. So deep that he forgets any of the fans exist. The fans forgot that a fucking wrestling, wrestling show existed in the hours of 8 to 11. Booze rained down on Elias. Elias needs the fans to silence their phones and hold their applause and, and more importantly, shut their mouths. Elias goes on to start playing and out comes Alistair Black. He does the whole entrance with the smoke and the candles. Comes up from his casket. Not a fucking sound in the Cajun Dome. It was very depressing. Alistair Black takes the microphone and says, well, If it's a deep sleep and consciousness that you want, 
You will get it tonight because I will make you fade to black. So this one was pretty quick. I mean, there was nothing to this whatsoever. You know, if WWE really wanted to make an impression, and I'm glad that they didn't do this, but if they really wanted to make an impression, they would have booked Aleister Black versus Seth Rollins in the main event of this show, and it would have tore the house down, and we would have had this show go off the air with a great fucking match on an otherwise dismal Monday Night Raw. But like I said, I'm glad that they didn't do that because the people in the Cajun Dome didn't deserve a fucking goddamn thing. Elias gets black masked out of nowhere, and that was it. Alistair Black wins. There you go. What a debut. Nobody gave a fuck. Raw Women's title. Ruby Riot versus Ronda Rousey. I, I believe this was Ronda Rousey's obligatory uh, after pay-per-view open challenge. Because there's no way that you could justify Ruby Riot getting a fucking rematch against Ronda Rousey. I don't even know why this match was taking place, to be honest with you. Like, who's going to look at Ruby Riot? against Ronda Rousey after the display that they gave Ruby Riot last night, and anyone's going to believe that Ruby Riot's going to win or stand the chance, never mind win, stand the chance, or get any offense in on Ronda Rousey. This was ridiculous. I didn't want to see it then, and after they buried Ruby Riot, I don't want to see it anymore. Title match took place. It was the main event of Monday Night Raw. The match wasn't, wasn't all that great. I honestly did not fucking care. I did not care. Ruby Riot got some offense in, but it wasn't anything that was going to blow you away. She didn't prove anything more so than than any other night that i seen her in the ring. Ronda Rousey came off the top rope, and she took out Sarah Logan and Liv Morgan with what looked to be like a cross body. Ronda Rousey should never be able to come off the top rope ever again. I'm sorry. That was a scary fucking moment for Ronda Rousey. She came off the top rope, man. The way she landed, she could have immediately, instantly tore a, a fucking uh, a muscle in her knee or a hamstring. She could have blown out a fucking knee. Something. I, I don't know why she jumped off the top rope in the, in the manner that she did. She completely undershot both Sarah Logan and Liv Morgan. Took them both out barely on the outside. Riot is on her feet in the corner. Riot grabs Rousey, but Rousey counters, launching Riot face first into the turnbuckle. It was like a, a reverse Alabama slam into the top turnbuckle. Rousey takes advantage and drops Riot into the armbar for a submission victory. So there you go. Ruby Riot, not a loser once, but a loser twice in back to back nights for this main event on Raw. And all she was used, it's even further proven now, all she was used for was to advance the Charlotte-Becky Lynch interaction with Ronda Rousey at the Elimination Chamber, and then WWE figured, well, we, we made Ruby Riot, we sacrificed Ruby Riot to the fucking Wolves at the Elimination Chamber, we'll give her a proper match tonight and then have her lose, of course. Because who thinks that Ronda Rousey is going to lose on the road to WrestleMania? This was a waste of fucking time. I don't understand why Ronda Rousey is even having matches like this when we all know what the outcome is. It's ridiculous. You're making everybody else look bad be because of what you're doing here. Like, I don't understand why you couldn't give us an Aleister Black versus uh, a Finn Balor or an Aleister Black versus a Seth Rollins or an Aleister Black versus a Drew McIntyre in the main event. This is what we get? Illogical garbage. This show was terrible, folks. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Monday Night Raw tried to book this show as some half-assed Raw after Mania. And it completely backfired and it blew up in their face. This was not the right crowd to do any of this. I love all four of these guys. And their debuts were absolutely ruined by WWE stupidity. There's only two nights in the calendar year that a Hail Mary show like this is going to work. And that's Raw After Mania and the Raw After SummerSlam. Lafayette, Louisiana should never, ever, 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 ever be booked to get another Monday Night Raw or SmackDown Live ever again. These people showed you why they don't give a fuck about professional wrestling. Now, yes, this went unadvertised. And yes, that's WWE's fault. But even if it was advertised, I find it very difficult to believe that it would have been any different if this show was advertised a week in advance with the debuts of these four guys. There's a time and a place 
for everything. And this was not the time and the place for any of this. You have to ask yourself one question. What did this do for the road to WrestleMania? Nothing. There's 49 days till WrestleMania. Now you can minus seven off the calendar. Okay? So now we're down to 42 days. What did this do for WrestleMania? Unless these guys are going to play a major factor and WrestleMania somehow is being completely rewritten, which would actually prove to benefit someone like Kofi Kingston. Maybe WWE is really rewriting WrestleMania and we're going to see all four of these guys in Mania plans from this point on. Maybe. Maybe we're really going to get a fresh start and a new era. But if we don't, what was the point of all this? You ruined everybody's debut. Everybody came off looking great and underappreciated by everybody in attendance. And when we go back and look at this show, when we see these guys again in actual WWE, you know, priority on a, on a show that matters in front of people that actually legitimately fucking care, we're going to go we're going to go back to this show. We're going to look back at this show and realize that this was their debut. It's like someone was out to ruin you know, we, we, let's ruin Aleister Black and Ricochet and DIY. Let's ruin them and bring them down a peg or two because everybody's talking about how great NXT is. It's fucking sad. This was a, this was a very, very depressing show. And I don't know what you guys thought about it, but let me know down in the comments below, man. This was not the right time, the right place, or the right city to do this type of Hail Mary play on Monday Night Raw. This just goes to show you that the overwhelming problems with Monday Night Raw are, are worse than ever. And it goes to show you what the real fucking problems are. They are absolutely desperate for, for some sort of ratings fucking increase. They're, they're desperate for some sort of fucking, you know, just social media banter. They're desperate for some type of uh, interest from anybody. They're not doing it with what they're doing on Monday Night. They know it. So they dipped into the NXT cookie jar and the result is going to be the same thing. It backfired in your face. It, it was fucking completely meaningless in every sense of the word. And it pains me to say that. It pains me to say that. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much. I'll see you all for SmackDown Live. We'll talk more about Kofi Kingston tomorrow. I got to elaborate on all this just fucking Kofi talk coming out of nowhere. So hopefully we get some sort of build to what I hope is something great coming out of this for Kofi Kingston, but it's very difficult for me to sit here and tell you that, you know, Kofi Kingston is going to WrestleMania. I, I truly believe that's not the case, but who knows? Maybe WWE, like I said, rewrote WrestleMania, which would benefit Kofi Kingston on SmackDown Live tomorrow. But I'll see you guys for the review tomorrow night. Thank you so very much for everything. Hit that thumbs up, and if you guys want to, please go check out all the other content on the channel. Uh, we got a ton of content. We got the Elimination Chamber review. We got Off the Script, Resident Evil 4 coming out this afternoon. So make sure you guys go and watch that on the channel tomorrow at 4 p.m. The new shirt is in the description, JD's Elite, now exclusively on Bonfire.com. Get yours today. We are three away from 100 sales this month, so please, let's hit that quota. I would greatly appreciate it. Follow me on social media, man. JD from NY206 on Twitter and Instagram. JD from New York on Twitch. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. And I will see you all right back here for SmackDown Live. And more talk on Kofi Kingston and where he fits into the possible WrestleMania card. I'll see you guys later.